Preston, just generally, just give us sort of an overview. Do you see this as an exciting time for your industry or a worrying time? Because there are so many possibilities out there. I think there couldn't be a better time to be part of this industry. I mean, the world is changing quickly. The technologies are coming, coming at us and with us. And it makes it a great time to be part of the industry because it's not static. What sometimes I think we in the, in the world think of as um, commercial vehicles as being this static, mature um, group of companies are really at the cutting edge of what's happening. I was recently in the Silicon Valley. I was meeting with companies in the Silicon Valley. And so much of the energy, even in that hotbed of, of the world, is tied to the vehicle industry and even specifically the commercial vehicle industry. So I think there's never been a better time to be part of the part of this fabric. If I, I, I should perhaps play the role of Inno Sender as she's not here, and I know that she would probably say to, to you from the Commission that your mobility package was perhaps not ambitious enough in terms of its uh, CO2 rules for vans. So w what would you say to that? I, th I, would, I would say that um, I believe that it was a um, well-balanced proposal. And, uh, and I think that as an outcome, it was something which uh, took into account uh, different views. You have always those who want to go further with the ambition, and you have also those who have a very low level of ambition. So you have to find a way which, on one hand, would incentivize the uh, further decarbonization of this uh, industry, the further digitalization and further innovation, which in a way comes together because the decarbonization is also a vehicle of uh, driving the innovation further in this industry and, uh, and, and, and to sort of make sure that uh, Europe continues to play a significant role in the vehicle manufacturing as it has been over the last almost 100 years or even over 100 years. And on the other hand, of course, um, uh, one has to... Um, uh, take into account uh, the fact that uh, we need to preserve our growth, we need to preserve our jobs. This is an industry which gives a lot of jobs and we also shouldn't be shooting ourselves in the foot when we are putting something on the table which is not realistic. So I think that there has to be a sense of ambition, there has to be a sense of realism and there has to be a sense of in incentivization. And I think that we have been able to put that three things together. Let me ask you then from the industry perspective, Preston, how much of an incentive has that, will that sort of proposal be? And, and when we're looking next year to the proposals for buses and trucks, what would you hope would come out of the Commission? Because I'm not sure Henrik will tell us much today, but I might ask him. Well, we continue to work together to try to figure out what is an aggressive, as aggressive as possible, an improvement standard on CO2 reduction goals for the coming 10 years, you know, to 2025 and 2030. And we're working together to figure out what is that possibility and how do we define it? What's the parameters that are included in that measurement? We all want the most CO2 reduction. It comes back to this common goal that we all have, which is to reduce CO2 because it's good for everyone. It's good for the environment and it's good for the cost of, of goods sold. So we all want the same thing here, and we're all just trying to figure out how to measure and what can we do. There's no real tension in this conversation. Do we have any questions for either of our speakers? Yes. Uh, do we have a microphone, please? If you'd like to just identify who you are, please. Yes, hi. Klaus Berglin from Citigroup. Um, I, I used to have a question to, to both Preston and Henrik. First, uh, Preston, the Tesla truck that has been announced. I just want to ask a little bit about payload. Obviously, if the driving conditions that they talk about um, are true in the range, uh, the battery needs to be absolutely enormous, according to my calculations at least, and that will impact payload because freight capacity has to give. Uh, when you think about your customers, isn't this the biggest issue that payload going down means that they will never switch to full electric? Unless, obviously, and this is a question to Henrik, unless trucks are getting longer and, and you allow more weight, which I think is also ruled out. So if we can talk about that uh, and Tesla's impact, thank you. I'll start by saying I don't disagree with your calculation method, um, but I won't spend any time on what Mr. Musk has himself stated. Um, there's a lot of really smart people, I think, in the industry today that are looking for the greatest efficiencies possible. And those people are producing vehicles every single day that work in the environment for everyone. And I think those really smart people are doing it as good as it can be done. And I think as the technologies evolve, then those methods will come to the market. 
But so you're, you're saying that, that batteries are going to change, they will be smaller, they will be lighter, that there are, is a possibility that... Of course, of course they're going to change, right? And of course the other technologies that we discuss, whether they're the biofuels or whether they're the natural gases or it's the ultra-efficient diesel engines, all have to and will continue to evolve, which will drive the shape of the industry forward. Um, it, it's, it's an obvious wish for all of us, and it's an obvious plan for all of us, and we've demonstrated that historically. If you just go back and look 10 years ago, where this industry was and the kinds of outputs of emissions that we had in particulate, in NOx, and CO2, there has been an over 90% reduction in particulate and NOx emissions in this time frame. There's been this dramatic increase in fuel efficiency or reduction in CO2, and the slope continues to accelerate. So I think we all feel good about what we've done and what we will do into the future. Henrik, how, what do you think when you see the Tesla truck? I think it's a cool thing, uh, nice to have. Yeah. But um, uh, whether it will be manufactured, uh, uh, let's say, commercially in large quantities uh, within the next 10 years, I don't know. But I think that it is, in a way, a revolutionary product because it shows what can be done. It's there. It's not something which is only, you know, drawings on the, on the table or, or, or some kind of models. It actually exists. You can touch it and it can actually drive. Uh, but um, whether it is, it's going to uh, play a significant role in uh, the vehicle fleet in the next uh, 10 years or so, there I have, I have at least for the moment my, my reservation. But it is historical in a sense that uh, it is also a call to the rest of the industry to say that uh, it is possible to do it. Because for many years, many were saying that, look, you actually can't do a seriously taken uh, electrical truck which also has a decent range but apparently it is possible. So, uh, so I think in that sense, uh, it, is, uh, it, it, it is a good way to incentivize the others. Now, there was also very good questions about the, um, the other, let's say, regulatory aspects where actually we could get uh, results and efficiencies and also further decarbonization if we would uh, go forward with this. Now, this is not a new thing, and um, in my previous, previous capacity as uh, head of cabinet for the vice president for transport uh, at the time, uh, we, we made also the proposal concerning the longer trucks and also the weights and dimensions, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it was not uh, supported sufficiently, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and it was not possible to adopt it. But um, there is, we got some improvements when it comes to design. Uh, Especially also, I think, on the, on, on the back side of the design, where you can have this kind of a boat tail and uh, things like that, which were not possible there. Uh, but, for example, on the longer trucks, there is some very strong resistance coming from uh, certain uh, transit countries in Central Europe. Now, I can understand their perspective, but it is much more difficult to tell that perspective, for example, to uh, uh, those in the north, the Finns and the Swedes, who just need these longer trucks also to do the cross-border operations in countries which have a very, very large territories and, uh, and also very long distances, and uh, there they produce the efficiencies which are needed. I think, I hope that there is a direction which would allow more the uh, agreements of the, of the cross-border provision of services on the longer trucks. Whether we would have those longer trucks to be accepted, this commission is not going to make that proposal. Next commission should definitely look into that as part of the, the other kind of measures that we want to undertake to uh, get further with decarbonization. And, and the same is about weight. I tell you, I think it's totally absurd, a situation where you have a country which I know very well, namely Estonia. And it has a neighboring country called Latvia. And they both have allowed to go up to 52. And then when it comes on the border, it has to be reloaded in order to be able to cross the border. It's something so absurd, I believe, that we have to find a way how to make it possible for those who have consented within the rules to do something. But, uh, but clearly, I don't see that this is something that is going to get traction on the European level. But at least those countries who want to go forward, who should be able to do that? The whole concept of the EU has also been with the reinforced cooperation that, you know, there are countries who want to do more. So let them do more. Let's not stop that. Um, and, and the situation where both have agreed to something, but on the border you have on and offloading is, is, is simply totally absurd. Last point, if I just may, uh, you. you didn't mention that, but I think it's also very important. I think it's, uh, it was you, person who said that in your remarks uh, about the platooning, because uh, platooning is also something where I think we have to keep an open mind. Uh, the, all the tests that have been undertaken until now have shown uh, the positive effects. And, and again, 
interoperability and cross-border provision of services, and that is also part of the digitalization. If we want to be competitive, we just have to make it possible in Europe. Preston, you want to come in. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Yeah, just, just as the comment, it's great to be in perfect alignment, right? <laughs> I mean, I the, the idea of longer vehicles carrying payloads that make sense is, the, is one of the great ways for, for efficiency and reduction. Weights and dimensions regulations that allow aerodynamic improvements is a great way for efficiency improvement. So we're completely aligned on this. Uh, sorry, who has the microphone now? Sorry, uh, I, I've lost. Sorry, who was the next person? I think maybe you, this gentleman here. Sorry, I can't see very well because of the lights and there are lots of hands going up and I'm, I'm not able, there, are, there are a few people here, I think, yeah. Thank, yes. thank you very much. I will, I will be very brief. I'm Matthias Mitka, I'm leading the work of IRU here in Brussels, um, the road transport operators, bus, coach and truck operators. Um, I want to come back to the CO2 standard, um, dear Director, Director General, because um, you both touched upon our industry being so heavily dependent on the combustion engine. And now we talk standards next year. My industry is very nervous as everybody, but will you consider to reward emission reduction benefits on the fuel side when you have combustion engines running on biomethane, biofuels, e-gas, or whatever that is? That was my question. Thank you very much. Okay. Straightforward enough. Indeed. Uh, I believe that uh, the, uh, the incentivization is, uh, is already uh, written in the, in the proposal itself uh, for, the, for the overall fleet. Uh, I am not sure that I would be able to uh, give you more at this stage, uh, uh, but nevertheless, I think that uh, we, need to, we need to consider what kind of um, uh, positive effect uh, could that deliver and also to, uh, uh, to hear what uh, views you would have and what kind of suggestion you would have. I can definitely tell you that we would keep an open mind to this. We'll just take one more question because we, we do have to break for coffee now. Uh, gentleman here, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Claude Chanson, the general manager for the recharge the batteries, advanced rechargeable and lithium batteries association. And of course, I have a question about electric mobility. Which, and we, I have to say, we are very happy about this commission initiative about uh, relocating more battery manufacturing in Europe. But, and we know that the question are now open to prepare such a plan. And my question would be to the uh, automotive and particularly the commercial vehicle industry, but because it seems that there is viable ways to have batteries for electric buses in the cities, for example. And that would be ideal customers for the batteries manufacturer in Europe. So my, my question was, are you prepared, are you involved in understanding and making this um, relocation plan man, uh, successful because you would be the customer of the batteries and as you mentioned, ultimately you will decide whether you will purchase these batteries in Europe or not. So my question is, did you really have some thinking or preparation of understanding why and how a model or business model would be successful for European battery manufacturing. Okay, so what sort of business model for battery manufacturing? <coughs> well, that's a, that's a tough thing to summarize in 30 seconds or less, I think, because again, the macroscopic view is the vehicle has to make economic sense for the purchaser. Ideally, that's done without government incentive because it should stand alone on as, as a commercially viable solution, which means you have to take into account um, the cost of production for the battery, the life of the battery, the recyclability of the battery. Those are a couple factors. You have to take into account the purchase price of the vehicle, the residual value of the vehicle, um, the vehicle's operating environment, the cost of energy if you applied road taxes to the vehicle, uh, charging infrastructures. It's just such a such an expansive kind of a thing to say. The answer is this. I don't know how to get my head around that easily. The fact that you are both of you say that very strongly that you must be technology neutral. Does that not complicate things in terms of investment in batteries and in recharging and refueling stations? The fact that that um, there's this sort of uncertainty which way the the, the world's going to go, which technology is going to be. You want to go first? My, yeah, I, I'll try. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, um, if we knew the future, then we could also pick the winner. Yeah. But I don't think that we have enough, like Eric says, facts to be able to say this is going to be the winning technology. And every winning technology always has also some kind of negative side effect. So it's better to keep the options 
on the table at this stage. Uh, and, um, and I think that will be the right thing to do. Now, having said that, it is a very clear incentivization towards um, uh, zero emission uh, mobility and zero emission vehicles. And, and, and for that purpose, of course, uh, uh, you kind of think that electrical vehicles have a, have a good potential to do it. But what we also shouldn't forget in this context, that the electrical vehicle per se is not necessarily an entirely clean vehicle because it's also very much dependent on how the electricity is being produced. And uh, okay, it is still better than perhaps a, uh, a uh, old style diesel vehicle, but uh, if the electricity is produced from coal, then it's clear that the electrical vehicle doesn't deliver such a kind of effect if it's going to be produced from the renewable energy. Uh, so I think this is also something we need to keep in mind when we talk about the zero emission vehicles. But uh, in different contexts, you also have different kinds of solutions. I mean, it is absolutely clear that the electrical vehicles will be the most beneficial and the uptake could be the easiest and perhaps also the highest in the urban context. And you are going to discuss that very soon, I we understand. Are, are. But, uh, but, you know, the light duty vehicles in the urban context, uh, which are electrical and then can be charged overnight. And I mean, clearly, this is something where, where you can have the, uh, the positive effects. But uh, again, when we talk about the heavy goods vehicles and uh, long distances, then uh, it is definitely not going to be the solution in the short term, maybe in the long term. So let's look at the other options. Let's, pick, let's look at all the options which are actually producing the positive effect. Gas can do it. But of course, uh, I also have I hopes on hydrogen as a whole. I also have, even though that's still, let's say, <clears throat> much to be developed and the infrastructure plays a very important role as well. But also biofuels, I mean, let's also not forget that once we would have a stable framework in, in place and we don't mess around with the different generations anymore. So I, I, I believe that uh, uh, not uh, uh, maintaining the um, technology neutrality at this stage uh, wouldn't uh, be the right thing, but at the same time, in different, uh, uh, con in, in different circumstances, uh, the, there are technologies which are going to be more used than others. Okay. I think we will have to break now uh, for hot chocolate and coffee um, and a chance to, to go and look at the vehicles outside. <laughs> I'd like to thank you both very much. A new bromance is born on the stage today. <laughs>